Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 26th of July, 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Um, we will be joined by live video Skype link by Alex Thompson uh, from Holland with Eastern Approaches. Well, the weather's looking a little bit gloomy here. Sun, summer has receded somewhat, so we've got grey skies with a hint of rain in Plymouth. And I think that's about it for the rest of the country. Um, gloomy times, Mike. Indeed. And uh, what better way of representing the state of the uh, country? Just before we came live today, I did tweet out we would be talking about the state of the nation. And uh, here we've got a lady that encapsulates the whole picture in one go. So let's meet Lynn Homer. And uh, she was reported in the paper a couple of days ago as walking away as Dame Disaster uh, with a mere 2.4 million pension pot, as you do. And uh, John Mann MP got a bit upset and he said Homer has been rewarded for failure. Well, the irony is, of course, that Mr Mann is exactly right. Uh, this is completely true because she was selected, trained and paid to help break down UK. And she's done a great job as a common purpose leader. So she's been in everywhere. And uh, we're going to remind people that where you see public policy, which induces confusion and chaos, this should make complete sense to you because uh, this is the real agenda which is being unleashed to destroy UK. So this woman was a disaster in Birmingham. She was a disaster in the Border Agency, Ministry of Transport. We then get her into the uh, uh, HMRC Treasury. She's done damage wherever she's gone because the agenda is to break up UK. And if you don't believe that from the Lynn Homer model, then uh, we should bring in Ms May. Yes, because Theresa May was uh, in Northern Ireland yesterday at Stormont Castle. Uh, and here's what she had to say during the referendum campaign. Uh, you said, speaking about the Northern Irish, you said it would be inconceivable uh, that there would be no changes to the border in the event of a Brexit. What do, you, what do you now see those changes as being? How do you define a hard border? And where in your mind is the border? Is it between the Republic and the North? or is it between the North and the rest of the UK? So what she is doing here, this is a complete act of treason, Brian, because she's imagining uh, the, uh, the death of the nation, as it were. She's imagining uh, the end of the union. Uh, she went on to say, well, if you look ahead, what's going to happen when the UK leaves the European Union is that, of course, here Northern Ireland will have a border with the Republic of Ireland, which will remain a member of the EU. But we had a common travel area between the UK and the Republic of Ireland for many of years for many years before the either country was a member of the EU nobody wants to return to the borders of the past what we want to do is to find a way through this that is going to work and deliver a practical solution for everybody as part of the work we're doing to ensure that we make a success of the UK leaving the EU and that's what uh, and that we come out of this with a deal that's in the interest of the whole of the UK so Brian uh, the deal that's in the interest of the whole of the UK is to break up the union and to imagine a border between, the, uh, between Northern Ireland and the rest of Britain. Of, of course, Mike. I mean, we're just now seeing the fruits coming to the surface. This is the way I look at it. You want to understand what these people are, are about. Look at what they say, what they deliver. Uh, we've had Eric Pickles saying that he was an unlikely revolutionary who was going to change the whole look of the uh, nation. We've had Tory MPs saying publicly, reported in the press, that the aim of the Conservatives was uh, the constructive breakdown of uh, the UK public sector in order to bring in the new, new regime, the new dawn. And that's what Theresa May is talking about. Alex, it's what's your views on that? Taking the long view on Northern Ireland, um, once every generation, Her Majesty's government makes a pronouncement that sums up how Westminster is thinking about the Union and Northern Ireland. In 1972, it was uh, Sir Reginald Maudling, when he was the Labour Home Secretary, got him back on his plane and said, somebody pour me a stiff whiskey. What a bloody awful place. So that was the night view in the 1970s. Then we get to 1992, and Sir Paddy Mayhew, an Irishman himself, uh, said when Northern Ireland Secretary... Her Majesty's government has no selfish strategic interest in Northern Ireland. And since then, it's been clear that the Conservatives, although allied with the Ulster Unionist Party, wished to ditch Northern Ireland. 
Now, we've seen the back of the awful Theresa Villiers, the last Northern Ireland secretary, but there's no need for her because we've got Theresa May saying things like that now. And no previous prime minister would conceivably ever have called Northern Ireland the North in a speech. That's Sinn Féin stuff. I mean, who's writing Theresa May's, May's speeches? I, I think the worst of it is she may be writing or spontaneously saying this stuff herself. It's quite clear she's got no interest in retaining Northern Ireland. She wants to leave it to its fate, regardless of the will of the majority of people. It's worth remembering, of course, that the Northern Irish people did not vote for Northern Ireland to stay in the EU, nor did the people of Scotland vote for Scotland to stay in the EU. They voted for the United Kingdom to remain in the EU. That's the question they were asked. So there is no automatic read across from the vote to wishing to break up the union. Don't let anyone pull the wool over your eyes like that. Uh, well, that's an interesting comment you've made about uh, Theresa May making up her own words, because uh, when you look at the uh, press releases that come out from the government with speeches, uh, sometimes it says on it, uh, this is a transcript of the speech as it was delivered, and sometimes it says on it, uh, this is how the speech was written, and it may have been delivered slightly differently. Now, in this case, uh, it was as delivered, it was transcribed as delivered, so it could well be that uh, this was not a speech-written speech, uh, at least as delivered, it wasn't written by somebody else. Mm, quite possibly. And the main thing to bear in mind about the border is um, security checkpoints is one thing. We had them for, for a whole generation through the Troubles. But the CTA goes right back to the founding of the Free State in 1922, as people have been saying in the chat room. It, it's basic knowledge that. More to the point, the Irish Republic is not in Schengen, and uh, therefore there is no uh, rationale at all for a border from the point of view of people or customs. Uh, because uh, Ireland already has, uh, well, not tariff borders, but certainly security borders and passport checks for people flying from the continent to Ireland or sailing. Uh, so really, the, the security issue is, is um, a smokescreen. Yes. OK, well, let's move on then. Um, I clarify that this was a story that I was going to cover yesterday, but we ran out of time. So this is a clarification and a correction from the Daily Mail. Uh, and it says... Uh, the first edition headline in an article on May the 27th about the funding of the organisation responsible for a controversial referendum advert referred to the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust as a pro-terrorist charity. We are happy to make clear that the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust does not support or fund terrorism. We apologise for the error. We're also happy to clarify that while J JRCT is one of the two organisations providing core funding to Operation Black Vote, it had no prior knowledge of the advert and did not pay for it. Well, let's just look at the advert. Here it is. A vote is a vote. And it's got uh, somebody on the right uh, looking very aggressive, skinhead type, uh, and really presenting the notion that anybody that uh, would vote for Brexit was uh, xenophobe, uh, right wing, racist. racist. Extreme. Uh, and who's behind this? Uh, well, this is the organization Operation Black Vote. Very similar, it seems, uh, to uh, Black Lives Matter in the United States, uh, designed, I believe, to put set one community off against another uh, and to drive that type of campaign. Uh, but what I thought was interesting was while the, the Mail had uh, retracted their front page from the 27th, uh, they had this article from a couple of days prior. And just to quote from this article is still available on the Mail website, so they don't seem to have retracted this. Uh, and it says, under the coalition, OBV received £85,000 as part of a £2.5 million campaign to get under-registered groups to vote. The Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust was established 100 years ago to promote peace, but now bankrolls supporters of terrorism. The trust, along with the Roddick Foundation, was investigated by the Charity Commission over its £300,000 support for CAGE, the Muslim extremist group that described Islamic State killer Jihadi John as kind and gentle. So. Um, they seem to have retracted one thing, but they seem to be still standing by uh, a previous article, which says basically the same thing. Uh, well, I've got to say, Mike, what's just jumped off the screen uh, now, and I'd, I'd missed this before, is mentioned the Roddit Foundation. So uh, we're now into funders around common purpose, which is uh, extremely interesting. Uh, but of course, we've uh, spoken out about this uh, third sector of these uh, agencies and uh, non-government organizations and also charitable trusts that are actually meddling on a daily basis in British politics, huge amounts of money. And uh, of course, it took the Daily Mail to blow the lid on Common Purpose and all the funders of Common Purpose. So interesting stuff. Um, it looks remarkably like subversion, Alex, doesn't it? 
Well, uh, obviously, the, the prime way in which to subvert a country is to use the most innocuous fronts possible. And I've said it before, but if you want to look into what these foundations and trusts are about, look for the 1950s U.S. Uh, Senate hearings into the tax-exempt foundations. If you just type in tax-exempt foundation hearings, PDF, you will see how much these, um, what should we say, philanthropist uh, organizations founded by tycoons around the 1890s, the turn of the 20th century, uh, degenerated, as they were intended to do, into fronts for Marxism, really, um, with obviously tax exemption and the ability to go anywhere where uh, churches and, and political bodies couldn't because they were held to be you know, pursuing the public good and no one could say a word against them. The Americans cottoned onto this uh, in the 1950s. We don't seem to have yet. And we've had comments, okay, polite comments, but questioning us uh, on the UK Column YouTube channel saying, what have you got against the Roundtree Foundation? They just go around doing good, don't they? Well, uh, I think it's, it's a bit of a flimsy excuse these days. People are seeing what the what kind of things these people get up to, and the pools from which their policymakers and uh, and desk workers are recruited. You know, you can you can have gone to a public school and um, Oxbridge and, and be ever so uh, well presented, uh, but still you could have been completely won over to the model of subversion. So the people doing the subversion are not even aware of what they're doing in many cases. Yeah. Right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to events in France, because, of course, Alex, you've been reminding us that uh, France has been in a state of emer emergency for quite some time now. We've had what looks like a color revolution going on there. Lots of civil unrest in the last uh, lot of months. But here we have uh, an event this morning which uh, takes things to a whole new level, uh, because it seems that uh, to uh, what early reports Things may have changed in the last few minutes since we came on air, but early reports I saw suggesting that uh, the two uh, men with knives that, that uh, entered the church and uh, slit the throat of uh, the priest and uh, seriously injured somebody else that was there, uh, that these were two Muslim uh, guys, that this was, uh, Hollande has apparently dropped everything and run off to Rouen where this took place, um, where I have no doubt as much political capital will be made as possible from it. Um, but, uh, but Alex, this takes this whole situation to a new level because this is a, this is a direct attack on what many would, be see, would see as being a, a core aspect of society. It's uh, particularly shocking for the French. Well, it would be anywhere to have uh, clergy murdered, apparently, in a church and even reportedly during a service, but even more so for the French because they have this uh, strict secularism, which they call laïcisme, you know, a lay state. And they've had that since 1905 in Belgium and Turkey, the other states in Europe that have gone that way. And notice the connection? Yes, they're all involved heavily in Gladio and they all have huge issues with um, nationalist religious uh, terrorism in their midst. So it, it goes to prove that um, the model many people in Britain are calling for, where we must have complete separation of anything Christian or religious from the government, is not going to lead us to paradise and coexistence because it simply means that uh, religious ideas uh, are not discussed in society and then they become the domain of those with the money and the determination to steer religions instead. Okay, well, um, let's, uh, let's move on to this then. Uh, Alex, this is uh, sending imams abroad who are prepared to kill. Yes, the... Uh, a uh, Dutch journalist who's tweeting here, Mehmet Jerit, was talking to an imam in Diren in the eastern uh, Netherlands. Uh, and this imam uh, comes from Dianet. You can see the word there on the, in the tweet and at the top, uh, which is actually the Turkish government agency that sends imams abroad. And at the top here, he's saying, uh, police, this is a scandal. This is a Dianet imam who's calling for or well, saying he's prepared to kill. And he was later uh, claimed to have been misquoted, including by the mosque he was just leaving uh, and going back to Turkey after serving. But look at the bottom there. He says in Turkish, in, uh, uh, in that many words, Ben budinicin gözümü kırpmadan carımı da veririm gerekirse can da alırım. So, uh, for the sake of this religion, I am prepared to, to yield my life, uh, but also to uh, kill, to take the lives of others. Uh, in terms, and he was prepared to say that because he was coming back to the coming to the end of his term. Uh, there's a, a mosque of that uh, persuasion, Dianet, just a couple of hundred yards from me. I can almost see it from my house, and they're very nice people, to be sure. But they've got the Netherlands and Turkish flags on the door, and that's not just for decoration. It's because they are a Turkish state agency, that mosque, and their imam is appointed from Ankara. 
Uh, Alex, this um, story was also covered in the Gelderlande paper, which uh, we can bring up on screen. And you're, you're getting into such an important point here that uh, when people talk about Islam or they talk about Muslims or Imams, uh, just like the Christian church, you've got to qualify it. Are you talking about Catholicism? Are you talking about Methodists? Are you talking about Baptists? But what we've got here are government-sponsored uh, religious people, uh, which is a completely different beast to mainstream, uh, to, to mainstream Islam. Yeah, that's, that's very much the point. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned in Insight in our episode about Eurasia, which will soon be available on the UK Column YouTube video channel, which is currently available to members on the UK Column website um, under Members Forums. Uh, I mentioned in that that uh, one of the key events in world history was when uh, Ataturk won the Turkish nationalist war after the Ottoman Empire did, crumbled. And, of course, one of the cr titles of the Sultan which crumbled was that of Caliph ruler of all Sunni, Sunni Muslims in the world. And the state basically took over that function. And to this day, no religious headquarters is allowed to establish itself in Turkey independent of the state. But the Ministry of Religion uh, can found this Diyanet body. And, and all through Germany, Austria, Benelux, wherever the Turks have settled, you see that Diyanet imams are sent out. All fine and dandy during the decades of, of secularism, when they were being told, you know, you're, you're there to promote integration and, and, and good humanist values. Uh, while being Muslim. But now Turkey is run by a different colour of, uh, of government, shall we say, and that the inevitable repercussion of that is that the imams who are sent out are of, shall we say, a different persuasion, and they, they change the views of many Turkish Muslims in Europe, but also the perception of Muslims by the wider population. Um, earlier, Alex, you mentioned uh, Gladio, and uh, if we look at this BBC article here, there's, there's a, a Gladio-style event happening on a daily basis now. Yes, I mean, that headline is just takes the biscuit, doesn't it? Okay, the, the BBC pulled it later and, and rewrote it, but um, it's just to stoke uh, angry whites, really, isn't it, this kind of headline? Syrian migrant dies in German blast. It's almost like de deliberately provoking people to tweet out um, how dare the BBC you know, to make the terrorist out to be the victim and call the, the attack a German attack when it was an attack by a foreigner in Germany. But you can see the game here. There's, there's psychological uh, manipulation going on in the headline. Yeah. And uh, you've also got this uh, one here from Politic, Alex, um, which is the uh, Interior Minister of Bavaria uh, who was speaking out on that. So I can just bring in a, a part of his quote there. Uh, if I read it very quickly, according to the Interior Minister of Bavaria, Joachim Herman, the 27-year-old Syrian who blew himself up in front of a concert stage in Ansbach on Sunday night, was previously known to police from other incidents. He said his asylum application had been declined a year ago, but since then he'd had the status of having his presence in Germany tolerated. Uh, what's the key point on this one? The key point is that um, the Germans are being more honest, as usual, than we are, because they and the Dutch need to give everyone a status. So when his uh, indefinite leave to remain, as we would call it in Britain, was declined, um, in Britain, we would just say that there's no action been taken against him because we have a deliberately dysfunctional um, asylum and immigration system, as you covered at the top of the program with Lynn Homer, who was previously in that capacity, or, or borders anyway. Germans and Dutch need neat categories. So this very conservative and quite honest um, Bavarian interior minister says, the day after the attack, no less, he says, yes, well, um, we, we couldn't give him asylum, so uh, we decided to give him the status of Duldung in German, which means tolerated. In other words, we, we know he's illegal and we're not going to do anything about it. And the Dutch are doing the same, really. So when you see that, don't uh, laugh or, or cry at the Germans. Think, well, the British government's doing just the same thing. Yep. OK, well, you've got a pretty controversial headline on, on this one, uh, Alex. Uh, sometimes the UN and international law are useful. Um, you're going to have to justify that one. Yes, I should have nuanced it by saying sometimes the people in the UN system and international lawyers prove themselves useful. In this case, it's a gentleman from the, um, the Latin American um, culture and tradition, Mr. Desayas. And of course, the Latin Americans are very strong on uh, human rights, as they would call it, and human dignity and, and so on. And from that point of view, he's employed as a, as a rights and international law type at the UN. And he said um, that the uh, mega trade deals that UK column has covered uh, TTIP, and more particularly TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because that includes a lot of Latin American countries on the Pacific coast. He's saying these actually um, 
are clean contrary to binding legal obligations uh, on states that they've signed up to by a treaty to protect their workers' entitlements. To do you, want me, do you want me to read this quote? Yes, please do. Yeah, okay. So he says, trade is not an end in itself, uh, but must be seen in the context of the international human rights regime, which imposes binding legal obligations on states, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And he said, uh, trade agreements are not standalone legal regimes, but must conform with fundamental principles of international law, including transparency and accountability. They must not delay, circumvent, undermine, or make impossible the fulfillment of human rights treaty obligations. So this is just a demonstration that the kind of people who go into, into, into international law are not the devil incarnate, even if they work for bodies that are very suspect, like the UN. Um, okay, the people who founded and, and shaped the UN politically and economically are very, very dangerous people, and many are out-and-out out Satanists and want uh, population reduction, for which you can listen to yesterday's broadcast with Dr. Dre Graham Downing for more detail. Uh, but the kind of people who go into international law, even those who end up at Chatham House, um, in one case is the um, former FCO uh, deputy legal advisor who resigned on conscience and principle over the Iraq war in 2003. Um, so that there are people around in international law who simply are there to point out that people need protecting by law and that these deals, uh, should we say, uh, behind the scenes are, are, are no good and are actually illegal under the, the current obligations countries have. Yes, OK. OK, well, let's move on. Uh, and we'll move on to uh, banking. And uh, this is a tweet that came out yesterday from the Bank of England. Uh, central, central banks issue paper money. Well, that's a lie for a start. Uh, the Bank of England certainly doesn't issue paper money. It, it prints it when it is given in order to do so by the Treasury. It doesn't issue it by itself. Um, should they issue digital currency? And this is uh, referring to this uh, Bank un Underground blog post. Now, Bank Underground blog is, is the blog of the Bank of England. Bank of England staff uh, write for this. Um, so if you're interested in these issues, um, go and have a look at it. Uh, and it's titled uh, Central Bank Digital Currency, the End of Monetary Policy as We Know It. Uh, and yes, they are indeed uh, thinking about the development of Bitcoin, as we've been warning for quite some time, and particularly the blockchain database technology that's behind uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and they say central banks have long issued paper currency. The development of Bitcoin and other private digital currencies provided them with the technological means to issue their own digital currency, but should they? Uh, and uh, they go on to talk about various issues surrounding this, and they suggest that we watch that space because uh, mapping out the implications of uh, central bank digital currency issuance is a very complex endeavor, they say. It's helpful uh, as a first pass to sketch our uh, partial scenarios, as I have done in this post, uh, for banking and monetary policy, but the devil lies in the detail. Research is going to what uh, is going on, so watch this space. So this is definitely a direction that central banks are looking in. They've been hinting at it for quite some time. Every time they uh, utter the words blockchain, it's looking like they're taking it a lot more seriously. Uh, and as from a, a liberty point of view, uh, that's not a good thing. Absolutely not. Right. <laughs> I, I needn't say anything. I don't think they're... No, and speaking of uh, liberty and freedom, let's uh, have a look at the investigatory powers bill because this uh, goes to its second reading in the House of Lords uh, tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, well, they ha it's actually been at committee stage uh, over the last few days. Uh, and uh, so they have, uh, the government, at least uh, in the form of uh, Lord Geoffrey Howe, uh, has uh, confirmed that the investigatory powers bill uh, is or could uh, be used to require companies uh, to remove encryption from their software. In some circumstances, indeed, uh, they could force companies not to use end-to-end -end encryption in future, uh, in any kind of future service that they're developing. Um, so here is uh, Jeffrey Howe. He's worried that, uh, that the ability of the police and intelligence agencies to intercept communications in an intelligible form would be considerably diluted if companies are allowed to continue to use uh, uh, encryption. It's a vital power that uh, police should have the ability to, to hack encryption. But not to worry. Uh, it could be a bit of a tricky uh, area, he says. Um, so we can always fall back on hacking people's individual computers um, if we can't get uh, the full... What we need. Yeah, if we get the full limitations on encryption, we can always uh, revert to hacking individual computers. Um, Alex, uh, just a, a quick comment on that. 
uh, it's a, a threat, but it's rather a paper tiger threat because there's no way in the world the best equipped signals intelligence agencies of any country can uh, get close access to all those computers. Huge amounts of uh, man hours and bugs and sometimes technical equipment physically present on the computer are needed for that kind of close access. Or you would need a spy point every 50 yards in the country, which is possibly what we're working towards anyway in populated areas. Uh, but no, it's, it's an empty threat, and I think it's a sign that Lord Howe is uh, quietly desperate. This is the man, don't forget, who stabbed Mrs Thatcher in the back when she said no to the EEC. Yes, OK. Uh, now, Germany, uh, preparing for war with Russia. I recommend this article because William Engdahl uh, is a great geopolitical analyst of long standing. Um, and it just, it's just uh, quoting, it's not made up it's, uh, by Eric Zeus, the author himself. He's quoting from Deutsche Wirtschaftsnachricht and German Economic News, a quite respected site actually in its way. And uh, he is talking about basically war gaming, as, as the uh, military types would call it. And they are talking about offensive war against Russia. Uh, which would, of course, involve invading Poland along the way, but that doesn't seem to have been an obstacle for the Germans in the past. Uh, and I would just highlight as well that Eric Zeus, the author of that, um, has appeared with us on our Insights uh, edition on Eurasia. So it sounds like I'm plugging it a lot, but it's it's really quite essential viewing for anyone who wants to know what's going on in the zone, shall we say, east of Vienna. Yes. OK, well, let's uh, move on to Syria then. And uh, yesterday, Matthew Rycroft, who is uh, the British ambassador to the United Nations, um, was speaking at the Security Council. And, uh, well, let's have a look at uh, some of the things that he was saying. Uh, he was decrying the fact that uh, the uh, Syrian uh, uh, military have now encircled eastern Aleppo. Now, if you remember, this is something that when Patrick Henningsen was here, we were talking about quite extensively because eastern Aleppo, Aleppo is the part of the city um, which uh, contains the moderate rebel groups that are busy cutting the heads off children at the moment. Um, so he is really concerned uh, that they are being encircled by the uh, Syrian regime, as he puts it. Uh, the current refugee, sorry, and, and, and so, uh, he is worried that 300,000 people are now effectively besieged and that this is going to turn into a humanitarian cat catastrophe. It's already a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, this part of Aleppo so it's got ISIS, it's got Al Nusra Front, it's got all the various moderate groups um, that are uh, really behaving in a pretty unmoderate way. Which is why, of course, we're not getting any proper reporting, are uh, we? All uh, that's happened is, a, is more or less a blackout. Indeed. And I would just say to Matthew Rycroft, you know, whose fault is this? I believe it is the fault of the British government, mainly. Creating the problem in the yes. first place. Um, suffer the children. Suffer the children, because, of course, uh, one aspect of the Syrian crisis has been uh, refugee children. And here we have Baroness Prasher, uh, and she is uh, uh, chair of the EU Home Affairs Subcommittee, the EU Home Affairs Subcommittee in the House of Lords. That's an interesting uh, combination of words there. Uh, and uh, they've just released a report on this, and she said the current refugee crisis is the greatest humanitarian challenge the EU has faced in its lifetime. At the sharp end of this crisis are unaccompanied migrant children who are being failed across the board. We find a clear failure among EU countries, including the UK, to shoulder their fair share of the burden. We deeply regret the UK government's reluctance to relocate migrant children to the UK, in particular those living in terrible conditions in the camps near the Channel ports. It is particularly shocking that so many unaccompanied child migrants are falling out of the system altogether and going missing. How can member states, including the UK, tolerate a situation where more than 10,000 missing migrant children in the UK, in, sorry, in the EU? Uh, we urge the EU institutions and the UK government to address these complex problems urgently. At the end of the day, unaccompanied migrants, child migrants, are children first and foremost, and we need to work together to care for them in a decent and humane way. Well, I'm just going to remind everybody once again of this report released in 2012. Uh, a report from the Joint Inquiry into Children Who Go Missing from Care. So any Syrian or migrant child coming into this country is going to be placed in care. And I want to remind everybody of this report because this is talking about children that go missing from care. The report says there is a scandal going on in England involving children missing from care and until recent cases of child sexual exploitation in Rochdale and other places put the spotlight on this issue, it was going on pretty much unnoticed. There are also major problems with the quality of data collected on trafficked children. The number recorded by CEOP, approximately 300 between 2007 and 2010, 
is widely thought to be the very tip of the iceberg, and the lack of robust and comprehensive data was also identified by the inquiry as a key obstacle to keeping these children safe. And we, this report was talking about thousands of children going missing from care every year, uh, and some of them come back, some of them don't, some of them go away for weekends and nobody knows what happens to them in that time, uh, mm -hmm. and they come back on a Monday morning or whatever it is. But let's just remind you of this article from The Independent a couple of weeks ago, 239 unaccompanied refugee children disappeared from UK care in 2015. This is the scandal. Aside from the fact that we've created this child migrant crisis in the first place, this is a scandal that these children are ending up coming, the ones that do come to the UK, disappearing from care and ending up what? It being trafficked, used for sexual exploitation. Yeah. Nobody knows because nobody manages the data properly and nobody tracks these children. So when uh, uh, Fallon, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, Tim Farron, uh, sorry, Tim Farron, uh, asked for these children to be brought over back in February and we challenged him on how he was going to protect them once he got here. He didn't reply to anybody's questions, including my own. Nobody is considering this. They've created a problem which is horrendous, but moving children into this country doesn't solve anything. Um, absolutely. And I'm going to say to people, if you can stay with us to the end of the news, um, we're going to get back onto this topic. And uh, we've got a particularly um, powerful interview which will follow today's news, which will explain some of the reality as to what's going on. So what's next? Um, Alex uh, Delinka, Deputy Chairwoman, yeah. tell us a little bit about, uh, about her. Brilliant lady. This lady is outspoken in Germany in a way that we have not got a single British politician, male or female, I think, to... Uh, to hold a candle to her, if that's the right expression. Absolutely agree, Brian. And you recently uh, interviewed her ex-husband, who remains uh, very friendly with her. And perhaps we'll uh, we'll play that when we have a good opportunity. But Sarah Wagenknecht uh, is the representative of the the good old left in Germany, that's particularly voted for in East Germany in the post-industrial, post-communist areas who've been disillusioned. And she is broken with the rest of her party, which is really hard left. You know, it's, it's the equivalent of if the Socialist Workers' Party had got together with the Skinnerite part of Labour and, uh, or the Corbynistas and, and revolted against the centrists, basically. That's happened in Germany. Uh, and so that party, Die Linke, the, the left, uh, has this Sarah Wagenknecht. And because she's a, a deputy leader of a party fraction, uh, she often gets the opportunity to berate um, Chancellor Merkel in the Bundestag in Berlin. And Merkel usually studiously fiddles with her papers or pen, as they usually do, you know, when they're being panned like that. Well, Wagenknecht is actually saying, uh, in, because it was uh, yesterday was the first day of German political reaction to the Sunday night and Bach massacre by a Syrian from the city of Aleppo, by the way. So he had his mind... Uh, turned there something proper by the, all the horrors going on there. But anyway, um, Sarah Wagenknecht said yesterday, in the light of these attacks, the Olympia shopping centre in Munich and now elsewhere in Bavaria, the Ansbach bombing at a concert, uh, it's obvious that uh, these migrant problems have uh, given us more, that we've, we've bitten off more than we can chew. And it wasn't as simple as the slogan Merkel gave us a year ago of, wir schaffen das, we can cope with it. For this, she has been rounded upon by her leftist colleagues on Twitter. But very gratifying has been uh, to see the number of Germans of all political stripes and, and none who've uh, told the, the, basically the new left to get back in their box and let Mrs. Wagenknecht speak on behalf of the people who voted for her. Yeah, remarkable lady. And uh, how, well, tell us more about the European left um, and how they're manipulating headlines, Alex. Well, this was just to show the quality of the calibre of the people who are now uh, realising that you can't trust anything in mainstream press anywhere in Europe. This is by Theodore Dalrymple, who's written a series of brilliant books uh, based on his experience as a, a prison psychologist and seeing the, the nation's mind being altered, really, and, and an underclass deliberately being created with no prospects. And he's now write, writing about how the European left manipulates you with headlines. And he's talking about Le Monde here, uh, which is the French equivalent of the Times, as you can see even from the typeface there on, on the mat uh, at the entrance of their office, and also from the sort of the, the sophistication of the journalists uh, who are walking on it, you can see from the clothing. But Le Monde has uh, uh, got wind of the fact that we were cutting one of our rates, uh, I think some kind of corporation tax to 15%. And as if this had already been a done deal, Le Monde was berating us for uh, fiscal dumping, which is a, an elegant French way of saying um, attracting people to pay tax, uh, corporations to pay tax in Britain instead of France. So even floating the prospect of setting your own tax rate is called dumping now. It's, you know, it's a, akin to using slave labour in, in Asia to, to uh, produce goods more cheaply than a Western country can. 
So it shows the hysteria involved, and, and Mr. Dalrymple's right. He uses the word left, but uh, Daily Mail, Express, um, uh, right-wing papers of much the same mould. So I would say more than left, I would say the mainstream. Right, and we've got more, excuse me, more trouble here with Les Echoes, uh, which is reporting about um, the fact that Europe isn't doing anything. So I'll just read out the quote here. If we can bring this one on screen, please, uh, Theo. Here we go. Of course, national governments within the EU still have very important powers, sovereign militaries, but also tax raising powers, education, organisation of employment. We simply have to observe that after the migrant crisis and the terrorist attacks in Paris and Brussels, the question everyone has been asking has been, what is Europe doing? So um, there seems to be trouble in the European mill at the moment. And uh, the point here is that Les Echo, which is the, the paper of the French businessman, um, its editorial starts off nicely by, for once, being honest and saying, since Maastricht, and in fact, since the 1989 ruling in Strasbourg, uh, European law has explicit, expressly taken primacy over French, British, or any other law in the EU. Um, but it goes on from that position to set up this ridiculous argument, putting words in the mouths of the French people or any other people in, after the recent terrorism, uh, as if the people of Europe are saying, what is the EU doing about this? Well, in all the continental countries I go around, I can, t I can tell you, apart from a few um, you know, academics uh, and that kind of uh, establishment type, I've yet to meet anyone while talking about these attacks who says, what is the EU doing? What they want to see is their own national and local police forces and their own judges uh, tackling the issue. And if anything, they're complaining that the, the police and, and judicial systems are being hamstrung by the EU. But no, it's being presented as a pretext for the EU to set up security services and have a, a united um, defence ministry and troops, because apparently that's what the people want in the wake of these attacks. And of course, Alex, Turkey features very big in all of this. And you've picked up again on um, Engdahl here, who's uh, talking about CIA activity in uh, Turkey. Um, yes. Apologies for calling the last article uh, by Engdahl. That one was by Eric Zeus uh, about Germany preparing for war. This one is by William Engdahl, the geopolitical analyst, uh, behind the CIA desperate Turkey coup attempt. Um, and it's the, interesting how he draws lines across to other parts of, again, Eurasia. And uh, Hungary, you could just about say, is the western fringe of, of what you can call Eurasia because it's half in Western Europe and half in you know, the landmass beyond, really. And Engdahl predicts that um, after the horrendous um, EU has been uh, de uh, really detected by the public, that Brexit was the, the, the first bit of the disillusion and then that the Viktor Orban uh, may be next to be toppled because he's come out. He hasn't said he wants Hungary to leave the EU, but they are going to have a referendum on an EU-related issue in October, which is should Hungary uh, set its own migrant quotas uh, regardless of diktats from Brussels. And on the same day, the Austrians are having a rerun of their contested presidential election in which the Freedom Party man might still get in. So Austria-Hungary, which is still a cultural entity, really, uh, 100 years after it was dissolved, might on the same day in early October, the 2nd of October, I think, might say um, uh, up yours to the whole of the EU project, and that really will be something. Uh, but of course, there's still some months before that for uh, colour revolutions to happen. And Hungary had an, uh, an attempt at that in 2006 already. Right, and you've got uh, two articles here, um, one from uh, Metal. Uh, this is uh, purging... This is talking about uh, Turkey purging uh, judges and prosecutors in a matter of hours, arresting them and so on. Uh, and also this from The Telegraph uh, about Turkey suspending uh, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, amid fears of further crackdown. And also the way that they've been treating uh, the people that they've been arresting. Yes, but taking the last picture there, um, the, the big text there is about Lieutenant Colonel Levin Turkan, who's not in the picture. He was an aide to the chief of the army, and he'd obviously been duffed up after being taken into custody after the failed butch. Uh, but the point I'm making is that the, uh, these men are not all, um, you know, hardcore uh, Islamist plotters or whatever you want to call them, Gulenists. Uh, they, they, they're people who are being got at. And you can see in the main picture there that guy who until recently was Air Force commander in some dirty striped polo shirt with his arm, hands handcuffed behind his back. Um, Akol Uztürk, uh, he was one of the supreme military planners until, right up until the coup. Uh, so some very nasty stuff has, has been going on there. And behind that, uh, you, the first thing you quoted was about an international association of lawyers and well, more particularly magistrates and judges across Europe saying, hang on here. Um, you know, Turkey has, has got rid of thousands of judges in, in one weekend and nobody seems to care. And between them was that Telegraph piece saying uh, Turkey has become, I think, the, the eighth or the ninth uh, case since the Second World War of a member state of the uh, Council of Europe suspending the ECHR. 
we did it for the troubles, uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's rather a drastic step to take. Well, this brings us back to my point, which uh, people struggle with regarding human rights and the fact that they uh, they can be removed just as easily as they're given. And, and who, who, who the heck decides what our rights are anyway? If, if it's a human being, we're giving that person inordinate power. Is that not the case? Well, it, it is. And uh, you could see this shortly after the first European human rights legislation came in in uh, 1998 in the first Labour term. Uh, I joined GCHQ in 2001 and we were still being, uh, or the, the existing staff were still being briefed when I joined uh, in 2001 on what it all meant because we were still trying to find our way. And one of the things they were saying was, forget English law. Well, they didn't put it that bluntly, but they basically said, forget English law and common law and, and uh, God-given entitlements. Uh, what we now have is two kinds of laws. And to use the French terminology, droit absolu and droit qualifié. So an absolute right, and uh, that's part of the ECHR, like the right to life, for example. But you also have qualified, which means not really absolute rights. Uh, and these are, for example, the right to privacy and the right to a family life. So yes, your children can be taken away and your emails can be read and your computer can be destroyed if the state feels like it. Yes. Um, right. We're running out of time, Alex. So just briefly on the book spot, please. Well, that's just a brief mention of the fact that um, Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kussler, who lived through a lot of tyranny in the early 20th century, is a great book, whether you get it as an audio book or as a, uh, as a published book, uh, because it shows really how revolutions eat their children. And this is uh, the fictional account of uh, someone who was a big shot in, a, in an absolute revolution, a, a statist revolution somewhere in Europe 100 years ago, uh, who is then arrested and he's on death row and he's having lots of dark thoughts about what the revolution did to people. And if you read it, it's very applicable to the kinds of mentalities that are running us these days. Yes. Okay, well, thank you for, uh, thank you for that. Well, um, eating the children of the revolution, eating the children. Um, Mike, you've mentioned there that uh, uh, basically, we don't know what's happening with the children. Well, the truth is out there. And we're going to say that uh, UK Column is delighted that an extremely brave metropolitan uh, police officer, John Wedger, has come forward uh, to give an interview talking about what has really been happening in uh, London, in Westminster, and around the Metropolitan Police in order to cover up child abuse. And we are streaming that audio interview immediately after the news today. Let's just move into that by having a very quick recap of some of the things that have been going on. And we'll just start off here with the demise of Xaro. Now, UK Column has always been highly suspicious of this organisation that seemed to have the in on some of the child abuse cases. Uh, they seem to be particularly good at... Um, creating a smokescreen almost, and they refused to get involved in a lot of the high profile cases. Uh, but they had huge money, millions behind them. They were constantly promising that uh, the true agenda of child abuse was going to be exposed, and they consistently failed to deliver it. Uh, this was part of um, the Times report, uh, which was basically saying that uh, um, this man, um, Mr. Thomas from the BBC, he's the boss, Kerry from uh, Panorama, uh, was um, lambasting Xaro, accusing them of damaging journalism by publishing wrong-headed articles, accusing a string of prominent people of being paedophiles. Well, let's remember this man because, of course, he was a uh, former Radio 4 boss and uh, he, he was pretty outspoken. Most female journalists do not have a thick enough skin to deal with the show's incredibly difficult environment. So you get the impression of a very unpleasant uh, man. And interestingly enough, he was boss of this lady, Nicola Stanbridge, who was going to investigate child abuse at Oxford and Cherwell Valley College, which UK Column had exposed. Uh, but she then said in a recorded interview that she was pulled off and she mentions her boss, which we believe was Mr. Thomas. Uh, critically, she said uh, that although she'd failed to speak to any of the victims of that abuse, she had spoken to the very authorities who were covering up the abuse, and therefore she was satisfied that nothing had happened. Yeah. Um, well, here he is, um, boasting that he had uh, got 10 mentions and 6.4k mention reach and 29 retweets. So uh, Mr. Thomas is clearly uh, very impressed with his self. And uh, here he is moving up as head of Panorama uh, and glowing praise for the BBC, BBC's greatest investigative programme, 
Panorama is the linchpin of the BBC's current affairs output. Track record, Mike, of second to none, apparently, in breaking big and important stories, uh, but not, of course, stories to do with child abuse. In fact, Panorama was actually used uh, to help undermine people who'd been coming forward uh, to say what was really going on with child abuse. And Andrea Davison here tweeted out that they'd approached her as well as Chris Frey and Bill Maloney asking suspicious questions. And all of those people, including UK Colin, were sure the agenda was to um, unsettle investigation. Well, we remember this lady, of course, Jill Dando. Um, what was she doing? She was looking at high level paedophile rings in the BBC. Uh, but not to worry, because the BBC's investigated themselves. And, um, well, this gentleman said when he got close to the paedophile rings in Westminster and the establishment, he simply had his offices raided by the police. And, hey, presto, Mike, the evidence disappeared. Of course, um, there was no sign of panorama in his case. Now we get to the meat of the issue because uh, today we've got this report in the mail that the future of Britain's top policeman is thrown into doubt after victims of the Met bungled VIP paedophile probe called for the damning report to be published. So we're not interested in the child abuse survivors, the victims. What we're interested in is protecting the reputations of people who've been caught in the crossfire. And uh, what has now come forward is something remarkable. This is an email. I'll put it on screen, but read it for you. Uh, we've sent it to uh, Mr. Penning, who was the former Minister of State for Policing. And he said, uh, we've said to him, um, can you please provide a written media statement in response to allegations received? that in your recent post of Minister of State for Policing and Criminal Justice, you were fully informed of widespread and high level child abuse and the corresponding cover ups by the Met Police, public authorities, charities and others to silence police whistleblowers where such cover ups included threats and intimidation. And despite promising a full investigation into these matters, no such investigation has been forthcoming. Well, as we might expect, um, this gentleman who's now been promoted into the uh, Ministry of Defence as the Minister of State for the Ministry of Defence, uh, there was no reply to the UK column emails. His constituency office simply refused to contact him for us. Uh, the Ministry of Defence media team stonewalled. In fact, they got extremely agitated when we said, uh, we want to be able to speak to him. Uh, they said this is nothing to do with his Ministry of Defence work. But I would suggest that if there had been failure in his previous post, that would impact on his Ministry of Defence performance. And the constituency office and the MOD put the phone down. Um, there was a there appeared to be panic, Mike. So why do you think that was? Can't imagine. You can't imagine. Well, let's have a look at what his duties were as the Minister for Policing. Uh, here they are. Victims and Witnesses Policy, Chair of the Victims Panel, Criminal Justice, Out of Court Disposals, Criminal Law, Criminal Court Procedures, Miscarriages of Justice. So he was responsible for those. Restorative Justice and the Veterans Review. Well, where did our information come from? It came from an extremely brave Metropolitan Police officer. His name's John Wedger. And uh, this man has blown the whistle on the fact that the missing children have been known about for years. They've been taken, uh, trafficked and abused from uh, children's homes across London and UK. And this movement and trafficking and abuse has been consistently covered up by the Metropolitan Police with the help of local authorities and charities and government ministers. And in a one hour interview with the UK column, uh, Detective Constable Wedger spells out how his career has taken him into this cesspit and how he has been personally threatened and indeed his family put under pressure and harassed in order to stop him blowing the whistle on what, is, what has 
actually been happening with these children. And as you will hear in the interview, he starts to show the sheer scale of this uh, because it's operating across the country and it has now been going on for, excuse me, tens of years. So I would just like to say this is a remarkable interview. He is an extremely brave man. I'd encourage people to listen to this. And can I say to you, at the end of listening to what he has to say, uh, if you believe um, he is worth it, and I certainly think he is, um, this information needs to be spread throughout Britain and overseas so that we can finally expose the criminal elite that is working through the City of London and our very own parliamentary system. I don't think I can put it stronger than that, Mike, um, but uh, this interview is, is just phenomenal. I think we'll end on that note. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I say to all of our viewers and listeners, please stay with this channel to listen to the live interview with uh, Detective Constable John Wedger. Thank you.